their participants to join and then we'll get started with a welcome. Um, so thank you so much for joining. Just hang out with us um, for a few minutes. I will say another welcome to everyone just joining us from the waiting room. Um, uh, thank you for joining us. We're going to wait just a couple more minutes um, as folks filter through before we get started. So thanks for hanging out with us. All right, well, welcome everyone to um, day three, episode three of Food for All. Um, this is our third session today on Wednesday. Um, Wednesday of the Food for All Summit is a skills building day, um, something that we like to do uh, just to really advance the skills of advocates and share share knowledge and information with each other. We had two amazing sessions this morning, um, just really picking the brains of uh, state senators, state delegates, a local council member from Wheeling um, about how to approach uh, lawmakers, how to make relationships, how to have good meetings, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it was, they were two fantastic sessions. So um, really glad to have been a part of that. Um, uh, and again, I just want to thank everybody for joining us. You have entered the session where we're going to talk about utilizing communications and social media to uh, advance advocacy work. Um, I'm super pumped about the professionals that are uh, part of this session and um, looking forward to, to gaining new knowledge today. So before we get started, I'm um, going to, well, I should introduce myself. I'm getting really bad at remembering to introduce myself I for because uh, I've done it so many times now. but. Um, I'm Spencer Moss. I'm the executive director of the West Virginia Food and Farm Coalition. We are members of the Food for All Coalition, and we were an organizing partner in the summit this year. And so um, I get the happy task of welcoming everybody to all of these events, um, and it's a super fun uh, role to fill. So thank you guys again. I'm going to turn this over to Austin Suzman from 84 Agency. Austin and Cam are providing technical assistance during the um, uh, the summit. So if anybody runs into some issues, please feel free to message them. They will help you out. Um, and Austin is going to do a quick little tech talk for us. Austin. Thanks, Spencer. Um, as Spencer mentioned, I am Austin Sussman from 84 Agency, and we're here to provide uh, tech support uh, to help everything run smoothly today. Uh, one thing I do want to make sure uh, everyone know knows is where their mute and uh, stop video buttons are. So 
you move your mouse over to the bottom left of your Zoom window, you'll see your mute and stop video button. We do ask that you keep your microphone off and your video off unless you're taking part in a breakout session or you are called upon to ask a question by one of the presenters. Uh, we are asking you to, if you have questions for the presenters, go ahead and put those in the chat. Uh, and likewise, if you are watching on Facebook Live, uh, we do have someone monitoring the comments on Facebook Live. So feel free to leave questions for the presenters in the comments there. We also do have the ability to block anyone out of the meeting should something untoward arise. So please remember to be courteous with your comments. Uh, and myself and my colleague Cam are here to provide tech support. So if you have any questions at all about Zoom, just uh, put those in the chat as well and we will be happy to assist. All right, uh, Renee, I will now hand it over to you. Great. Hello, everyone. Welcome and thank you so much for being with us here today. Um, you know, it's really encouraging to see so many virtual faces here, so many folks invested in this critical work around food justice in West Virginia, and we're really thrilled to have you here and certainly appreciate your time. My name is Renee Alves. I am the Communications and Operations Coordinator at the West Virginia Center on Budget and Policy, which is one of the member organizations of the coalition hosting this week's Awesome Summit. And my role here today is really just to serve as our session moderator. I am absolutely delighted to be joined by Emily Chittenden Laird and Hannah Sawyer, who will be the real superstars of today's session. Emily is the COO of 84 Agency, a communications and consulting firm based here in Charleston. And she'll be starting us off with an interactive presentation on how to thoughtfully craft our messaging in ways that align with our organizational values. And Emily's expertise will be paired with that of the wonderful Hannah Sawyer. Hannah is the state communications manager of the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities Safety Net Initiative. And her presentation will be supplementing Emily's and diving into some strategies for how we can use Facebook as a tool to take our thoughtfully crafted language and get it out into the world in ways that land effectively and move our audiences to action. So. We have a lot of great content in store for you all. Again, we're so happy to have you all here with us and a sincere thank you from all of us for spending some time with us here today um, and for all your work in the community. We really, really do appreciate it. So thank you so much. And with that, I will pass it over to Emily to start us off. Thanks, Renee. So nice to be introduced by you. So for those who don't know Renee, you should get to know her and she's joined the Center on Budget and Policy team uh, here in West Virginia, and she's going to be moving here in like a month. So we should all send her a warm welcome. We're so excited that she's moving here from California, but that's why it looks so sunny and wonderful where she is because it is. So welcome, Renee. Um, as Renee said, hang on, my slides won't advance. There we go. Um, we're going to be talking about strategies for effective social media advocacy. And um, Renee and Hannah and I have been meeting a lot to talk about, you know, what would be the most valuable thing to present. And I think Renee gave a really good overview of the structure that we're going to use today. And for me, as I was considering this, um, you know, I really thought there are so many things that you can bring in terms of social media. So what are the most important pieces um, that we can share with you this afternoon? So um, we've synthesized this to an interactive workshop and we're really excited to head down the path with you. So um, I just wanted to share a little bit about 84 Agency in case you don't know anything about our work. So uh, as Renee said, I work with 84 Agency as does Austin who just gave the tech talk and Cam. Um, but we are a communications and consulting firm based in Charleston, West Virginia. And we work with several change major makers um, to tell compelling stories to connect with people and make an impact. So um, Jen and Carling, y'all uh, may know of them. They're our founders, co-founders, and they started 84 because they saw a huge need in the advocacy community to be able to bring um, compelling storytelling and communications that would really shift things um, for good in West Virginia. And so they've been doing this work for several years and have worked with lots of the different statewide organizations as well as local uh, nonprofits in the state. And um, our team just keeps growing. So we're super excited to get to be here with you today. But we do lots of work in the communications realm 
on social media. So um, that's where we're sort of focusing in today. And it's our team. Um, and everybody's favorite team member, I think, is Quincy, who you'll see in the lower right hand corner. Um, there are some other dogs that have joined the team recently, so we need to get their pictures added to the website. So, like I said, you know, when we were really thinking about this, I thought, you know, there are a lot of people that come to 84 Agency and they have questions like, what is the most effective time to post on Facebook? Like, what time of day should I be posting? Or they ask, how many times a day should I be tweeting? And who should I be following? What should I, you know, so these like semantics things. And oftentimes we take that conversation about the sort of what and the how, and we say, we really need to pull back and talk about what, what is the content? What are you posting? And so when Hannah and I were prepping for this, we really agreed that one of the most full thing, useful things that we could bring you is really thinking about the content that you're creating to share with your audiences. So um, I wanted to read three statements that I found from organizations involved in food justice work in West Virginia that I think are really powerful. When it comes to food, we're all in this together. We're changing the direction of Appalachia's economy. It's an invitation to the community to create a vibrant, just, and equitable food system. So I love these because whenever I read them as someone who doesn't work in the food justice arena directly and doesn't you know, do the hard work that y'all are doing every day, I feel inspired and I feel connected and like I care with what these folks are saying. And I think that one of the reasons that I feel so connected to it is because these are using values to communicate. So at 84 Agency, we really believe in the power of values-based communication strategies. I think that um, if you even look at the two recent campaigns that we just saw, the presidential campaigns, we have Keep America Great and we have Battle for the Soul of the Nation. And you know that those are some of the top communications professionals in the nation that are crafting those communications. And both of those really connect with the values of the constituencies that they were trying to reach. And so they resonate deeply and they really go to the heart of what motivates people and gets them to engage with uh, an issue or a campaign. So what are values? Well, values are principles or standards of human behavior that we understand through culture. So values like don't need a definition. They're not super wonky. You don't have to be like an insider who knows all the jargon to understand them. Um, they're a shortcut. So values give a shortcut straight to the hearts of the audience that you're intending to communicate with. And it, it lets them know why they should be a part of the work that you're doing and why they should care. Um, values, whenever they're effectively used, I think also help us feel more connected with one another. So you're not just connected with a cause, you're connected with a community of people who care about that cause. So let me paint like a quick picture about um, why I think values-based communication is so important. I used to work um, for the West Virginia Child Advocacy Network, which is the state's uh, coalition of all the child advocacy centers in the state. So the way that we used to talk about our work, when, when someone said, what do you do at West Virginia CAN? And, and what is a child advocacy center? This, this was my pat response. I would say, well, child advocacy centers provide a multidisciplinary community-based response when allegations of criminal child abuse arise. So if you didn't fall asleep, you would be like one of, you know, a million people who ever didn't fall asleep whenever I gave that like sort of eyes glazing over a description of the work that we did. Um, the reason that does not communicate are there are so many. One, you know, I say multidisciplinary team approach, community based response, allegations of criminal child abuse. Already, I have created an environment where you have a million questions. You don't understand what I'm talking about. You have to know insider jargon, like what. What even is a multidisciplinary team? How does that get created? What does criminal child abuse mean? Like, I don't get it. I don't understand. Like, 
isn't all child abuse criminal? I mean, it's horrible. So I've created a, a statement about the core of the work and what I want people to know about our work that is not inviting people in. So let me contrast that with this, okay? So what do child advocacy centers do? Empowering children, restoring hope, ending abuse. All of a sudden you feel inspired because you hear about hope, um, you hear about restoration, you understand that we work with kids and that we're empowering them and that we're working in the abuse arena. So you've got the essential information that an outsider audience and an insider audience needs to know to feel a part of the community of work that we're doing. So values really matter and they make much more effective communications tools than statements without values. So why do they work? Well, they're sticky. Um, so they're memorable and um, easy to communicate, like make America great again or keep America great. That's very sticky. We all know it like off the top of our heads. Um, values help people understand why they should care about or engage with an issue. So if you just say something, you know, like food justice, well, justice is a value, which is an interesting thing. So there's like a value embedded in it. But if you just say, you know, food access, that just is sort of like, okay, I don't even understand what it is. It's kind of wonky. But if you add, for example, the food justice to it, then all of a sudden it feels like, well, of course, I want everyone to have just access to food. So values really help make that connection with why you should care. And finally, um, they let us see things in new perspectives or new ways. So again, whenever we talk about food access, that may not be something that's really substantially on people's radar. It may not be something that they have to think about. Um, you know, for my old work um, and the child abuse arena, you know, there are, I mean, luckily most people have not themselves experienced child abuse. And so it may just feel really far off to them. They don't understand why should they care about it. And so values really create that connection and invite people into the work. And by framing it with a really good value that is effective at reaching them, you're going to create a frame that helps them understand why and how they can connect with an issue. So who is using values? So one would hope because we're doing such values-based work that nonprofit communications kind of across the board would have value statements in them. Well, the problem is research shows that 60 to 80% of nonprofit communications like any value statement at all. So like no value statement. It's things like the thing that I said at the beginning, multidisciplinary team response to criminal obligations of child abuse. So um, just it's missing that values piece. And so then how else do people learn about the issues that we care about? Well, a second way that people learn is through the media, right? And so they're encountering these through the media. Well, the media doesn't use value statements either. They're just like, no, just the facts, bring the facts. Now, I, I would argue that I think our media does assign values to some things. And I think that's a whole other conversation for another day. But I think the big question here is, so if nonprofits, whenever they're talking about their important issue-based work are not using values and media isn't using values, then where are those values coming from? Because we ascribe values to things. We fill in those blanks as an audience. So I would be interested for people in the chat right now, if you could just chat some different ways that you think that your values were created over your lifetime. So an example of that might be, I was taught values from my church growing up. So let's just have folks chat some of those things. So we've got parental values passed down, family, culture, school, media, friends and peer groups, that's a good one. Girl Scouts, so we've got community organizations, the people that you choose to interact with, more community organizations, school, formal education, that's a really good one, church and community the experiences that you have in your life. So I think that's a really good one. 
all these things contribute to culture too. So culture feels like a big umbrella for how we get at our values. So exactly. So we all, <laughs> Jim McKay said that one time at Bandcamp. Okay. So um, we all come with our own set of values. So whenever nonprofits aren't presenting values and the media isn't assigning values, we come with some sort of a precondition that may connect us to a, a specific issue or work, but likely for most of us is a value that um, isn't connecting us deeply. So without a good framing of values, we often don't have a helpful way to get into an issue. So cool throw a value in and you're good. Well, sort of. So the thing that I would say is not all values are created equal. And that there are certain values that are more effective than others in helping audiences understand social issues. Um, it's really important uh, if we wanna craft the best messaging that reaches the most people on social media and our other communications venues that we identify values um, first that work and then we build our messaging around that. All right, let's walk through an example of this. So homelessness. Homelessness is an issue I think that we all have a really good understanding of and I think it's an interesting one to look at. So let's think about four different values. So we've got compassion as a value. We have moral human rights or that might be also translated as dignity as a, as a um, value. We have equality of opportunity as a value. And then we have interdependence. So I would like for you all to think for a moment about which value you think is the most effective getting audiences to change their views. So that might be in a way that they feel more bought in with the issue. It might be that they're ready to volunteer, they're ready to give money, they're ready to take an advocacy step, so call their legislator. So what value do you think creates the most positive change associated with the issue of homelessness? All right, I would like for you to chat the one that you think is the highest. So we got compassion. Compassion, human rights, a couple of folks saying human rights, one interdependence. Cool. All right. Well, this is interesting. I actually uh, did this exercise with my son this morning, who's 10, and he said, this is complicated. Why are you asking me this? And he said, compassion. He thought that compassion would be the most effective in communicating about homelessness. Well, it's really interesting. There's a, a group called the Frameworks Institute and we love their research. They're incredible. Um, and I think Cam, you were, uh, I think I sent you that. Yep, there it is. So if y'all wanna check out their website, please, please, please do. It's really effective um, resources and they're free. They're, most of them are available for free. They do incredible amounts of research on what values are the most effective in communicating about different social issues. So they did this um, with a, a huge sample size, you know, 10,000 people um, about homelessness and they, looked, um, they tested it in many ways. So like street interviews with people, focus groups, a bunch of different ways. And here is the graph on what was most effective. So you can see um, this is a graph that is the change um, if they've been presented with values-based messaging using this frame. So you can see that um, while I think the most people commented said compassion, it actually performed the lowest in terms of creating change. And in categories, when you look sort of across the board, that moral human rights or human dignity is the most effective, followed by interdependence. So it's really interesting to think about like, well, why is that? Why is compassion, which was a lot of our instinct off the, off the bat, why is that not the most effective? I'd be really curious if anybody wanted to unmute themselves and give a stab at it. I know there's someone brave out there. 
I'm going to call on someone soon if you don't do it. Would it maybe be because people feel like there are so many other things they care about? Yeah, so like compassion overload. That's an interesting idea. Any other ideas folks have? arguments tend to be the weakest form of argument, at least in persuasive techniques. I'm sorry, I missed that. Can you say it again? Um, oftentimes emotional arguments, while they have their place, are sometimes less persuasive than other techniques. Uh -huh. So um, the one of uh, they have the great news is frameworks gives us the reasons for this. So um, they've communicated why compassion is not as effective as we thought it would be initially. So the thing about compassion is whenever I say um, Renee doesn't have access to food this week, I have a lot of compassion for her. Is that it promotes an us them thinking. So where there are like insiders and then the people that need the help are like out there. They're not us, right? And so the thing that I always say about compassion is it's like almost the flip side of a coin that on the other side of that coin is pity. So pity, I don't think if I put pity up there, anyone would have been like, ooh, ooh, pity, that's gonna be the one that wins. But they're so, so interconnected because it really does lead to othering. And othering is not the most effective. While it may cause us to think, you know, like to be really emotionally moved by something or really concerned, it doesn't necessarily lead to behavior change. So that's one of the interesting things to know um, about compassion. I think the other thing is that when we're thinking about compassion and we have the opportunity to other a person impacted by an issue, one of the things is that we start to try to solve their problems for them. So if I say, oh, poor Renee, she doesn't have access to food this week. Well, maybe she should have like, you know, not bought that new sweater or like, do you see that privacy fence behind her? I mean, like if you have a privacy fence, I don't understand how you don't have access to food and, and you can sort of go down that pathway, which is not helpful, right? Because we don't need to be like individually solving what is a, at its heart, a systemic issue. So compassion is not the most effective. Equality of opportunity. Um, so statements about equality of opportunity might sound something like, well, everyone is at risk of homelessness or we're all three paychecks away from homelessness. And while that may be resonant to some people, there are a lot of people for whom they like, that doesn't pass the sniff test. Like they read that and they think, well, I mean, Bill Gates isn't three paychecks away from homelessness and my grandpa isn't three paychecks away from homelessness. So this kind of equality of opportunity um, for sort of the bad, it promotes a fear-based um, response and fatalism. So then you're just like, well, God, like this is, is so terrible. And now I feel like I'm at risk and, and then they just get paralyzed. So um, equality of opportunity is also not one of the highest performing values. Now, the thing that I'll say is, let me go back to this graph really quickly. So while these were not the highest performing values, I do want you to see that they're better than no values at all, because these are compared to a control, which was with no values-based messaging. So they did produce positive results. They just didn't do as well as the other values. So you can see that you know, you still, um, in, in most of, except for one time, compassion produced a negative change. But most of the time, these are producing positive change. It's just not the most effective or positive change you can have. So the ones that do work. So as we said, moral human rights, basic human dignity, that performed very well. Um, it, it creates a feeling of community and commonality as does interdependence. So both of these values, I think, work for some of the same reasons. Um, it, they encourage people to think about problem solving at a systems level. And that's what we want to advocate for whenever we're working on issues like food justice is not for people, like I said, to individually problem solve for the one person who doesn't have food access, but rather to be thinking about the system based response. And so both of these really do that for us. Um, so some messaging examples here um, for moral human rights. 
Everyone has the right to be treated with dignity. Living with dignity means having access to decent housing. Or a messaging example with interdependence might be, when some people are struggling, it hurts everyone. Right now, many people are homeless or at risk of becoming homeless, which makes it harder to contribute to and share in our country's prosperity. So these are interesting because um, as we said, they are more effective. They promote that systems level thinking. They help you feel a part of a community. They help you really think about um, that this as not an individual problem, but really is something that affects the entire community. So we think that um, at 84, the way that we think about this frequently is a concept that we call open ground. So open ground may be um, a new phrase to you, but uh, a more familiar phrase might be common ground. And so common ground is something that we hear all the time. So they're over here, they're over here. Let's find some common ground and, and work toward a solution. And um, while I, th I think that, that it is really important to work toward solutions, the thing about common ground is that um, it usually requires compromise to lead people to a shared vision. And sometimes we have like a core belief or identity or history or tradition that makes moving from our authentic point of view very difficult. Um, and it can invalidate or discount lived experiences or past traumas. So we really like to think about this idea of open ground. So if common ground is you're over here and you're over here and let's meet right here, common ground or open ground is more like a Venn diagram, which is what is true about your authentic lived experience as a human and true about my authentic lived experience as a human. And, and what is that open space that we haven't yet found? Um, and so I think that there are some characteristics of open ground and can, we can go ahead and chat those if you want to. Um, one is that open ground approaches people with equal dignity. Um, it doesn't ask us to leave ourselves or our histories behind. Um, it doesn't ask us to leave our political viewpoints behind and we can come as sort of like the whole of who we are. Um, open ground uses people first language and people first representation, it embraces complexity. So sometimes I, I think the last thing I have, oh yeah, it's, I didn't put it on this list because uh, it requires patience. So it's harder, I think, to find this sort of open ground space for issues. Um, it requires a lot more work but I think it is really compelling whenever you find the thing that resonates with a lot of people who have a lot of different experiences. So we've talked a lot about values and I want us to now sort of make that mental shift and transition to the values in your work right now. So you all are, we're here for the um, Food for All Summit and there may be a million different reasons that you're engaged in this work. So you may be involved in feeding people directly. You may be involved in policy advocacy. You may be an ally and just a person who cares about this issue. So all those are great. And actually, I think it's wonderful that we have the wide spectrum represented today, but I'd like for you all to think individually and I'm gonna give you two minutes to do this. And if you could just do it on like a piece of paper beside you or post-it note or something, I want you to think about three values that, are, that you think would be most effective in talking about this food for all work. So three values that you think are most effective. So like I said, I'm gonna be quiet for a couple of minutes and let you really think on your own and write those down.
Okay. So now what we're going to do is you all have those three values that you wrote down. We're going to go into small groups for a few minutes. And I would like for you in your small group to think about which values meet the open ground criteria for food justice. So Cam had um, chatted those to you and we're gonna give you five minutes in small groups. Um, so uh, Cam, I think that there are instructions that you can chat there, but what I'd like you to do is just introduce yourself. So like share who you are and why you're engaged in the work. Um, share the values that you wrote down. And then as a group over the five minutes that you have, I'd like for you to workshop the values together as a group and bring back the two values that you think would be the best for this work. All right. So Austin, you want to go ahead and send folks to those small groups? Folks, it looks like we still have a few folks uh, still in the main room. Um, so if you have not yet joined your breakout room yet, uh, if you go into the bottom of your Zoom screen where your mute and start video buttons are uh, and move over to the right side of the screen, you'll see a button that says breakout rooms or maybe a button that says more. And if you click that, it'll open up breakout rooms. If you click that breakout rooms button, you should see the breakout room you were invited to. So we are still live streaming to Facebook, but Renee, I just wanted to share out loud for folks who can't see the chat. Um, if you could share the thing that you put in the chat, I think that's really interesting about this in our budget and policy tweets. Oh, yeah. So we had a blog post released today that's a bit of a teaser for a larger report we're releasing at the beginning of 2021, and it's on the economic costs of the addiction epidemic in Kanawha County specifically. And so we had a blog out today. Um, let me pull up the tweets on my computer. And the blog's titled The High Cost of Losing Harm Reduction in Kanawha County. And it was sort of diving into the non-fatal costs of the addiction epidemic and like how um, we see hepatitis C and HIV um, instances rising in Kanawha County and how expensive it is to treat that as opposed to preventing it before it happens. And so the tweets I sent out this morning reads, in early 2021, the West Virginia Center on Budget and Policy will be publishing a report highlighting the economic costs of the addiction epidemic in Kanawha County. Our newest blog offers a sneak peek at some of our findings and helps explain why a compassionate response is also cost effective. And that received two retweets and two likes. And then in the thread below, I said, hepatitis C and HIV cases are on the rise, largely due to the reuse of needles and the cost of treatment is enormous. Syringe services programs like that ran by solutions-oriented addiction response effectively prevent spread while also treating people who inject drugs with the dignity that they deserve. And that received four retweets and three favorites. And it was also not like the main tweet. It was the second tweet in a thread. And I've, I found that usually um, the, the tweets that aren't the primary tweets get less attention than the primary tweet does. But in this case, um, the, the second tweet did. And that was the one that mentioned dignity as opposed to compassion. So I just thought that was interesting, especially in the context of your presentation, like a real life example. I like that dignity one, Renee. Thank you. I should run all my tweets by you before I post them.
Cam, I have a tech support request in room number three. Um, is it all right if I send you to that room to see what's up there? Um, if, uh, sure. <laughs> I know we're still live streaming, but I, I think it's funny when Austin has to break in for tech reasons. It, he sounds like the man behind the, um, like the man behind the curtain from The Wizard of Oz. <laughs> <laughs> that moment that happens. Well, Austin is actually a professional announcer for those of you who don't know. He, uh, he, well, when we had a minor league team, he got paid to be the announcer at the games. No way. That's so fun. Yeah. Emily, that is uh, five minutes. Do you want me to go ahead and bring everyone back in? Yep. Welcome back, everyone. So um, what I'd like for you all to do is to chat the top two values that your group came up with. Security and community. Equality of access and equality of opportunity. Equal access and community. Rights and action. Equality and security. So it's interesting. Um, I do think that there's a lot of resonance with um, the, the one that was studied by frameworks on homelessness around what issues might perform well. And I do think that um, dignity feels like one that would perform really well for this issue as well. So now that we've been thinking about what is the content that you want to convey, I'm gonna turn it over to Hannah to share about how to make it real. So Hannah, over to you. Great, thank you. And I am going to share my screen. All right, so welcome back everybody from your breakout rooms. I hope you all got your creative juices flowing. Um, I wanna thank Emily for breaking down this really important concept for all of us communicators, which is that your messages only work if people hear them. Uh, so now that you have this foundation for building messages that open people up to a conversation, I'm going to talk about how we actually get them out using social media. Um, a little bit about me. My name is Hannah Sawyer. I'm the State Communications Manager at the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, which is a very long title that translates into, I am a communicator and campaigner working on ending poverty, like many of you. So I work with about 100 other folks, uh, often in DC when there's not a pandemic, um, that do policy development and research, fundraising and advocacy, and as well as more communication. 
Um, but the best part of my job and the reason why I'm here today is that I help support and empower a learning community of 40 plus state-based or organizations, um, including the West Virginia Center on Budget and Policy. So thank you, Renee, for inviting me. Um, social media is a linchpin of our advocacy and communications work in our network. We use social media because it's where many people, not everyone, I think there, I wanna call out that there are some important people that probably many of your groups serve who are not on social media uh, because of access or technology issues, but a lot of other um, Americans who need to be brought into our issues, who need to hear our messages are there, especially in a pandemic when a lot of us are at home as well. And uh, I'm gonna focus today on Facebook. I will be honest that I, as a person, don't really have a Facebook page, I don't use it. But whatever our personal hangups are, um, I wanna stress that we need organizations like yours on this platform. And I'll give you two big reasons why. The first is that there are 223 million active monthly users in the United States. So that is a lot of people, that is a huge audience. And the second is that there are a lot of organizations that actually oppose access to food, oppose access to SNAP, um, who are on that platform. And so we need voices like yours uh, that are out there putting people first, uh, using facts to back up our stories and counter uh, narratives. So I'm gonna assume that there is a spectrum of experience on this call with uh, Facebook. Some of your organizations uh, might not post regularly to it. Uh, some of you might be posting every day, multiple times a day. If you are on that end of the spectrum, I encourage you to share your wisdom in the chat. This is as much about peer learning as it is about Emily and I talking today. Um, for those of you who don't use Facebook that much um, or you're new to it, you're developing your strategy, uh, this presentation is geared towards you. I know that Facebook is a big, sophisticated platform, but your strategy for how you use it doesn't have to be. And you can really boil it down to three buckets, which are create, advertise, and engage. When I say create, I mean think about an identity that will be the backbone of your content. Uh, what do you want your voice to sound like on the platform? Then ask yourself, where are you going to put money to promote that content? Who do you want to reach? And when you reach people, how are you going to engage them? What do you want them to do? You don't have to overthink this. Uh, I think it's more important to build a strategy and to follow it uh, than to be really detailed in, in what you're planning. So be consistent. Make sure that what you create, your posts, your visuals, reinforces your identity. Uh, plan to regularly invest in getting your message in front of people and then offer those people an opportunity to take action. So let's start with content. Um, this is where your values-based messaging comes in most directly. It is really important to create good content because it brings people into the conversation uh, as Emily laid out. It maximizes the reach of your paid and your organic posts. Good content sounds human, doesn't sound like a, a bot or cyborg wrote it. Um, it's accessible because it is based in values, not jargon, and it gets to the point. Um, I'm going to show you an example from Feeding Texas, and I chose this not just because I live in Texas and I have a slight bias for it, but also because this post ticks a lot of those key boxes. You've got humanness in there, it is concise, and the quote that they chose speaks to the value of interconnectedness, which we learned earlier on is a really effective grounding value. I wanna point out a couple of other things here, which is that um, photos of families do really well in our paid advocacy campaigns in our network because they can be used to signal a lot of other values, some of which you guys raised, uh, security, community well-being. Um, so we like to use those a lot in our paid campaigns. Uh, Facebook also rewards posts that people, um, when people are linking to other content like they did here with NBC News, and to extend the reach of your organic posts, it's really helpful to partner with other organizations, either intentionally by planning ahead of time or just by uh, tagging them as they did here. So uh, I said this is about peer learning and um, I want you guys to take a minute and drop in the chat some of the types of visuals that you've used that have worked well for your organizations. And I think, uh, Renee, I'm actually not sure if I can see the chat. So I don't know if you want to call out some if folks are dropping them in. Sure. Uh, 
kids ah. participating. Can you see, Hannah? I found it. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, yep, kids participating, infographics, farms, portraiture. Uh, I want to point out infographics. It doesn't always have to be a photo. It can be a visualization. People are great. Kids, food, livestock. Awesome. So if you are new to Facebook, just take note of what people are putting in the chat um, and then jot this down. You can use these ideas to build a bank of images. It's really important that all of your posts have images. The platform rewards that. Um, I'm going to keep moving, um, but please keep, keep chatting. Um, so as I said, creating strong content, working with others to amplify that is a really effective way to extend your organic reach. But Facebook is basically a pay to play platform at this point. So you have to set aside an ad budget if you really wanna reach people. And running like ads to grow your audience is where you should be starting. If you have a bigger audience, you extend the reach of your organic content um, and it will improve as you move on to kind of more sophisticated advertising strategies, it will improve the return on your investment in those. Also, if there is a month long ad blackout on political content or social content because there's a contested election, you can still run like ads. So this is an example from our state partner in DC. Um, they ran a series of like ads throughout the summer. Uh, we enc encourage our state partners to do this periodically so that they are always growing their followers. Put it in your budget. It doesn't have to be a big line item. It can be $100 every couple of weeks, which is actually what DC spent. Um, but I promise you that you will gain followers by doing that. I wanna know, does your organization have a social media advertising budget? And if you do, how did you build buy-in there uh, to? to add, to throw some money at this platform because I know as nonprofits, we have tight budgets, they are restricted. We have a lot of demand for our services, but I think this can be a really powerful advocacy tool. So if you have some thoughts, some tips to share with your peers, I'd love to see those in the chat. And I do wanna make sure that we save a little time at the end for questions. So I'm gonna keep moving through these slides, but if you have tips, please uh, drop them in there. And the last thing that I wanted to bring up to you guys or present to you is that um, engagement is really important. Once you've added followers, you're not done. You have to go back to them and re-engage them. Think of people who like your page as your base. You wanna keep your base involved because they are your evangelists. They will spread your message to their friends and family. They will comment on your posts. They will like it, they will share it. And then it shows up in other people's news feeds. So uh, after you've run some like ads, you've built your audience, the next step that I would recommend is to create an advertising campaign that's targeted to your fans. And in that campaign, give them an action. I think getting people to like your page is relatively inexpensive, um, but our groups have had a lot of success, especially recently, in asking their fans to sign a petition or to send an email to a legislator opposing work requirements in SNAP, for example. Um, people are at home. <laughs> Economic justice, food justice, racial justice is on our minds. Now is the time to reach out to them. And they're looking for ways to engage safely. So you can actually offer them that. Um, we usually find that signing a petition is kind of the lower level of uh, lower lift, um, lower cost. But as you build trust, as you build brand identity as people get to know your organization, kind of move them up that ladder of engagement and be intentional about them. Ask them to, to kind of join in more by signing up for your email list, volunteering if you're a, boat, a food bank, you know, or donating to your organization. So my final uh, campaign ad example here is one from Hunger Free Colorado. And what I like about this one is that the language in the visual, which is not a photo, um, is really tailored to the people that they are trying to reach. And it's eye catching. Did your kids miss school meals last year? It is a good reminder that even though we as nonprofits don't have things to sell, like for-profit businesses do, we do have something of value to offer people. In this case, it's information, it's a PEBT card, it's making sure that people have food to eat. So I would just encourage all of you um, that to not be shy about investing and in sharing your content, especially if you've been intentional about building it. 
Um, and as I'm turning it back over to Renee, who I think is going to facilitate some Q&A, I just want to go back to the chat for a minute and uh, ask you guys to share your successes. How have you activated people in your community using Facebook? Let's see. Asking followers to answer increases post engagement. That is great. Seeing lots of good tips in here. Awesome. Okay. Well, that's. Um, kind of the end of my slides for here. I'm going to stop sharing. But uh, Renee, I'll turn it back to you in case you got any direct messages or if folks have um, uh, questions that they put in the comment on Facebook. We can open it up for Q&A, I believe. Great. Thank you so much, Hannah. And thank you so much, Emily, for your great presentations. Um, in the Zoom chat, I'm not seeing any lingering questions. We do have about five minutes left. So folks, if you want to drop questions into the chat here or even feel free to unmute yourself and ask them out loud yourself, you are more than welcome to do that. And we're happy to spend the rest of our time picking the brains of Hannah and Emily. Yeah, and I will just say if uh, any of the folks wanna, on the call want to come off mute and share some of your successes, I'm seeing a lot of great ones in the chat, um, fill in a little more context. We'd, we'd love to hear what you have done this year. I have a question about getting around uh, the algorithm. It seems like anytime I post something that has a link that it will get buried. Uh, whereas if I post something with just a photo and then put the link in the comments, I'll get more engagement. Is there, got any tips for that? That's interesting. I haven't heard that um, come up directly, but I will actually um, dig into that a little more and go back to some folks um, and share with Renee, I think, some, some feedback on that. Renee, since you manage your account, I don't know if that's something you've come across as well. I have not ran into that either, actually but it's good to be aware of, certainly. Um, I see Jim McKay asked, what would you recommend around giving Tuesday outreach in this space around food security? Just before we move off that, I, I did wanna say that um, Austin and our team is actually our digital guru. Um, he knows lots about this stuff and he keeps up with all the algorithms and everything all the time. So Austin, if you wanna, Go ahead and um, turn your video on. I think it would be great to get your voice in this. Did, did you have anything for the last question related to links? Yeah, absolutely. So Facebook, um, you know, as is to be expected, they want to keep you on their platform as long as possible. So over the last year, we've really seen a trend where um, even like longer text posts with an image um, are getting much better reach than shorter posts because people spend longer times looking at those. So anything that you can do in your post to keep people on the Facebook platform as long as possible, whether that's doing something like lead generation ads where you're collecting their data on their platform rather than sending people to an external website um, or you know, rather than linking to a blog post, just putting the text of that blog post on your Facebook page when you can. Um, the Facebook algorithm really rewards content that keeps people on their platform. So um, Austin, keep your video on because I think you probably got the best info to share of any of us. Um, but uh, I think that the question was about Giving Tuesday. Is that what you said, Renee? Yes. Yeah. Um, so I think um, Giving Tuesday is a really tricky one in that everyone is competing for the same air. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a challenging space to be in. But um, we, I think that one of the things that we've seen is uh, being able to uh, collect donations natively to the Facebook platform is actually a really helpful thing to do because like Austin just said, they wanna keep you on their platform. So if you're trying to raise money on their platform, 
um, again, it's like you got to sort of keep things in their system. So Austin, you want to talk a little bit about that? Because I know that that has been challenging for several people that you've assisted. Yeah, so Facebook, um, there's kind of the Facebook fundraising platform works in two ways. The first is um, so any registered nonprofit has a listing on the Facebook platform and people can start Facebook fundraisers for those nonprofits um, without any interaction from the groups themselves, as long as you're a registered 501c3. And then those checks get sent to whatever address the IRS has on record through the Network for Good platform. Um, however, you can also register with Facebook to get those donations directly deposited into your bank account. And then it's linked up with your organization's Facebook page um, so it's a little more streamlined process. However, uh, that process can take time. And so if you're thinking about trying to get that set up for Giving Tuesday this year, uh, if you haven't started that process, you're probably not going to have it set up by Giving Tuesday. Um, but I definitely would recommend looking into um, getting that, that set up. It's, I think it's called Facebook Payments is, is the name of, of that, that process. Uh, and it is, you know, you've got to send them your banking information and your IRS documentation and all of that kind of stuff. Um, however, Facebook, uh, and I believe maybe Network for Good and a couple other uh, larger groups out there, maybe PayPal, uh, provide Giving Tuesday toolkits with like graphics that you can put your branding on and that sort of thing. And so definitely, I think um, participating in Giving Tuesday, you know, if there's people out there that are looking for organizations to give, it's always a good thing. Um, but also remember that there's a lot of competition there. And so finding opportunities to fundraise on social media that work with your organization's uh, normal schedule um, are, are, are as, if not more important than taking part in something like Giving Tuesday. Great. Thank you so much, Austin. And it is 2 p.m. Eastern now, so out of respect for folks' time, um, I will wrap it up. I want to thank Emily and Hannah again for taking some time to share their knowledge and expertise with us. And I want to thank you all for spending some time with us today and for all of the amazing work you do in the community. We really do appreciate it. And we hope we left you with some lessons to further enhance your social media advocacy efforts around building a more food secure West Virginia. So again, thank you all so much and take care. <laughs>